Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Carla Finkelstein. I'm associate professor in the Department of Biological Sciences. Um, I'm a cancer researcher, and I'm here to answer some of the questions that Kelly passed to me. First of all, I would like to say that it's really, really sad that we cannot walk around the drill field for the Relay for Life. Uh, every year, my lab has a tent next to the drill field, and we walk until like what? Three in the morning, actually, until the last one of us faint and decide that uh, needs to go home because it's, it's, it happens to always be very cold. So uh, this year is, is really a pity that we cannot do it, um, but I hope um, we can, we can um, kind of pass the passion that we have for, for, for curing this disease to all of you and, and, and move the torch for next year so we can do it next year, okay? So um, Kelly contacted me you know, a while ago and sent me some of the questions that you might wanna, um, for which you might wanna have some answers. And I'm gonna to try to answer it with the best of my knowledge. And, and I apologize if I don't answer everything in, in, in layman terms enough uh, for everybody to understand it. And, and of course, you can always um, reach me by email to finkelc at vt.edu for more questions, okay? So, um, so the first question that Kelly sent me, and I have to say all the questions were very difficult, um, uh, very good questions, and I, I needed really to think a little bit on how I will answer these questions. So the first one was, what do you choose to study research cancer? Um, I might disappoint you with this answer, but I have to say that uh, unlike most of the people that study this disease for personal reasons early on, um, mine was completely different. Um, I always knew that I would be a scientist since I was like this, this little. Um, by the time that I was eight or nine years old, cancer was in everybody's mouth. Um, and at that time, um, I, I don't know, I always knew that I would be a scientist. And I guess because everybody was talking about cancer, I said, okay, I, I will study cancer. And another time I had a, um, a cousin of mine that was a total bully. Um, one of those guys that you definitely don't want to have around in your life. And every time that I say that I wanted to do something, the guy always said, no, you won't be able to do it. Um, well, again, I, re I really got pissed at him at one point. And um, every time that I wanted to, to do something, he was like, no, no, you won't be able, every time. So um, I was around um, that age. It was very early, like my third grade or fourth grade, something like that in elementary school. I was like, well, you know, I'm going to be a scientist and I'm going to study cancer. I don't even really remember why I said that, probably because everybody was talking about that. And he looked at me and it's like, cancer has no cure and you won't be able to study cancer. And, and I was like so pissed at him. I was like, oh, no, now I'm going to study cancer. <laughs> I have to say that... Um, he probably doesn't know all this, but he had an influence on me that was more than expected because when, when I when I decided what school, what college to go, I also wanted to go to a college that was really, really, really difficult in my hometown, um, just for scientists, for people that wants to um, pursue a career in science. And I remember having a similar conversation with him and say, oh, I just want to go to this school. And it's like, oh, that school is impossible only 10% of people that go there graduate. So it's not for you. Obviously I end up going and I graduate from that school. So um, I guess one day I should talk to him, um, not my personal choice, but, um, and tell him that he was really influential in my decision to study cancer. And I'm very, very actually happy that that's the field that I chose to study. Um, which lead us to the next question. What made you so passionate about cancer research? I, I love this disease for two reasons. First, because I think I can, I, I think from the scientific, scientific standpoint is like you're fighting the, the most difficult of all fights. You know, cancer is a genetic, is, is a, it's a disease that has a, a genetic basis. I mean, you need to have certain mutations for this disease to take place. And, and you are dealing with 30,000 genes, they all behave in very specific ways. And when they are mutated, they behave badly. 
and it's very hard to predict things. It's like um, fighting the, the most difficult fight of all. And I really love the challenge of that. Um, from a scientific standpoint, is tremendously rewarding all the things that we find that are accessory to cancer research, but has helped other disciplines. So I, I really feel very passionate about cancer. And I also, um, as a scientist, I think the ultimate goal is to help people. And with so many cases of cancer, cancer around the world, and I think whatever my research can contribute can, can be more impactful, can be impactful in some way in someone's life. So um, I, you know, that's what I want. I just make sure that whatever I do in my research can help someone. So I guess that's why I'm so passionate. I don't have a perfect speech for that. Um, I apologize. Um, so let's go to the next question. Um, are there certain biological mechanisms that influence cancer treatment efficacy? So the efficacy of a cancer treatment depends on so many things, um, more than just mechanisms. Depends from, from, um, depends from everything that goes from um, what type of cancer it is, um, the stage at which the cancer is detected, the therapeutics that the um, patient is uh, engaged into, to the mindset of the patient. I always think that um, a lot of the, um, I, I really think that success on the therapeutics also depends a lot on the patient being willing to recover. Um, uh, there are mechanisms that they are particularly important that we need to target um, when when we um, work on car cancer therapeutics, um, we try to be mindful on the therapeutics that is given to the patient to specifically target those cells that they are they're regulated somehow. Yes, there are very specific mechanisms. There is no point of going through all the names of those mechanisms, but um, there are very specific mechanisms and there are very specific drugs that targets those mechanisms. In some cases, that is good. In some other cases, it's not good. In some other cases, you wanna have um, therapeutics that they are more, they can more broadly target cells. And the main reason is because um, the more specific the mechanism is, um, the, the more likely that the cell will, will develop some kind of resistance to that therapeutics. That's why most of the therapeutics are Kind of infusions of, 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 of different drugs together. Um, so you can, your goal is to really eradicate the cancer cell. So the idea is that with, with multiple therapeutics, um, or with one therapeutic with multiple drugs, you can actually target for sure that cell and eliminate it. Um, what environmental risk factors increase the likelihood of developing breast cancer? Um, this is a really cool question. And probably what makes it cool is that it, it really hits in our on our research program. So um, in order for me to answer this question, let me give you um, a little bit of, of background on what we do. So in my lab, we study um, how um, cells sense environmental conditions and respond to those changes in environmental conditions. And in, in, in for us, the, the model of a study is uh, breast cancer. And one of the reasons is because there are numerous studies that shows that um, women's work in night shift, which is a way to change your environment because you are synchronized to a 12 hours light, 12 hours dark um, cycle in which you are active during the day and rest during the night. Um, now in those individuals that they are exposed to shift work, there's a high, um, a high prevalence of breast cancer. Uh, it's actually um, up to 37%. And those are usually nurses, flight attendants, um, women working on factories and night shifts, um, a number of, of individuals. And um, this doesn't really, uh, although most of the studies are related to women and cancer, uh, there are new studies that shows that men exposed to this kind of shifts also develop other type of cancer like prostate cancer. 
I think there are more studies ongoing on this. So um, is so uh, altering your circadian rhythm in a chronic basis, meaning for very many years, okay, not one night, okay. Um, that is one potential risk factor, but there are other risk risk factors, of of course. I mean, um, you know, that goes anything from um, your any potential unhealthy behavior to exposed to chemicals. In the case of breast cancer, also there are um, uh, other issues that has to do with, um, um, you know, uh, um, getting their the women that usually get their period very early in life. They are they have um, higher propensity to develop breast cancer, or women that they don't have um, child until very late in their lives. Um, but uh, these are all environmental factors for sure. And there is some kind of um, genetic component that it needs to be associated. When is the best time to administer treatments according to chronotherapeutics? Well, this is someone that read my, my work. Um, so chronotherapeutics is, is a field that is under development and is a field that I'm trying to push as much as I can. In this field, what we try to do is we try to we try to com we try to explain um, clinicians and that it's not only about giving a drug to a patient, but finding the right time to give the drug to the patient. And this is with intention of um, this is with intention of of being more effective when we treat um, a patient for one particular disease not necessarily cancer for very many other diseases as well, and reduce the side effects of, of these um, drugs. These drugs in particular in cancer are tremendously toxic. So the point is, the point is like, let's say, let me just give you an example. Um, very many cancer uh, drugs, they target DNA replication. And DNA replication, let's assume that it happens during the day phase of the, um, of, of, of the day, right? I mean, it's like during the light phase of the day. So let's say between eight in the morning and 5 p.m. So one strategy from, from the standpoint of the clinic would be, okay, let's give the patient the drug, uh, the chemotherapy drug um, at night or, or some of them. And then the patient can um, sleep and doesn't feel so bad the side effects. Well, one of the problems with that is that if you think carefully, the drug targets DNA replication. So if the DNA replication happens during the day and you're taking the drug, the drug at night and the, and the, and the half-life of the drug is only six hours, it's very unlikely that you will have the drug by the time the process that you are targeting takes place. So because of that, we think we are trying to push for a more mindful um, 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 delivery of drugs. So we can we can target what, what we're supposed to target with this drug, but at a specific times, because then it will be more effective. We might not need such a big dose of drug, and then it will be less toxic effects and improve the quality of life of the patient. If you have a situation like the one that I described, and, and, and you know, uh, a solution will be, okay, well, let's see, let's give more drug to the patient at night. So then for sure there is something that will that will be um, present at next day to target the DNA replication. Well, that will be a disaster because then it will be more toxic and it, it will be terrible for the quality of life of the person. So all these kinds of things are, are, are things that we really need to revisit and, and we need to find out um, if we are applying the therapeutics at the right time of the day. Another possibility, for example, um, let's say some of the studies suggest that radiation therapy would be better if we apply it during the night phase. Okay, well, that conceptually is, it might be interesting, but can we actually do it in, in, in the hospital setting? I mean, can you, let's say that you discover that the best time of the day to apply therapeutics for radiation is at three in the morning, okay? Because that's what basic science says. Well, then you have a problem because then you need to have a unit open at three in the morning and then you need to have an operator that is conscious and responsible and, and can make uh, wise decisions at three in the morning. So um, the application of chronotherapeutics, I think has a lot of promise. Um, I think we can help a lot with that. I'm a, I'm a person that believes that we can help especially with the delivery of drugs and with early detection. Um, 
we're working on the implementation. There are several of my colleagues that they have done tremendous, really good work in implementing some of um, current therapeutic approaches in the clinic. And we are at the very early stages of the process, but I, I think it's a way to go. And I really hope the clinicians get on board on this concept. Um, so what are the stages of cancer and do they vary based on individual age? Okay, um, the stages of cancer, stages of cancer is, is, um, is a way that we use to actually um, classify a cancer and um, make sure that we all speak the same language. So for example, let's say I talk about this particular cancer in this particular setting in United States, and let's say that I talk about a stage two breast cancer. Um, and I wanna make sure that when I talk about stage two breast cancer, or when I discover in a stage two breast cancer, uh, correlate with someone else in some other place in the world actually found and describe it the same way. So the way that stages in cancer have been um, classified is an international, is an international, follows an international um, um, rules. So everybody in the world that discover things that relates to one particular stage know, know that that we're talking about the same type of, um, uh, the, the, the same, the cancer that is at the same um, level of progression. So um, uh, stages goes from stage one to stage four and stage one is, is a very uh, early stage of cancer is very manageable. And in some cases um, you don't do um, any, you, you don't follow any action, you just, you just monitor the progression of the cancer because it could stay there for dormant for very many years. Um, and within each stage, there are different sub-stages um, that depends on, for example, where the metastasis happened to the organs that they are close to where the tumor is located or to more distant organs. So there are different stages, but we all use in the world the same type of classification with intention of, of being sure that we, we all speak the same language when we describe a tumor um, or a type of cancer. Um, does that varies with the age? The stages, they don't vary with age. The, the stages are um, defined based on the tumor, not based on the, on the person that actually um, carries the tumor. So how does COVID-19 diagnosis affect the cancer patient? Well, I think this is a, this is a great question. Um, for very many reasons. One of the first reasons was that, one of the early reasons is because um, very many cancer, um, cancer patients didn't know whether, um, what would be the consequence of being, being infected with COVID with SARS-CoV-2 and develop COVID-19. And the other one is because once we developed these very effective vaccines, they were not absolutely, um, it was not absolutely clear at the beginning whether, um, patients should be exposed to this, should be um, taking the vaccine or not. Um, nowadays, we know that is is um, safe and it's recommended for cancer patients to be vaccinated unless they are allergic to some of the components of the vaccine or unless they are enrolled in, or they are experiencing some kind of immunosuppression for which waiting for the vaccine would be a wise decision. And in that case, you always need to consult with your um, clinician. Uh, with, with your oncologist, sorry. Now, um, the other problem with COVID-19 and cancer was really that because the, the hospitals were really overflowing with, with COVID-19 patients, very many cancer uh, patients didn't have access um, to the hospitals because they could be, um, to, to receive their treatment because um, they, they could get COVID. So that was probably the most troublesome part of the whole COVID pandemic, at least um, from my end, because uh, we did see an increase on, 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 on problems with, with cancer patients because they couldn't get their therapeutics. Uh, they couldn't get access to their therapeutics. Um, nowadays, um, it, it is recommended for the cancer patients to um, get vaccinated. Um, uh, as long as, like I said before, they don't have any uh, uh, any kind of immunological reaction against any of the components or, or they are immunosuppressed or participate in a clinical trial and they need to um, consult um, 
the, the clinicians who are in the clinical trial. Um, I think, I think a cancer patient getting COVID-19 um, has also a lot of psychological impact, um, which I think even if we do basic science like, like myself, we shouldn't forget. I mean, um, we should treat cancer as a whole a disease for the whole body, not just a disease for, just a disease that has to do with the tumor and a way to eradicate tumor cells. I think we should, we should work with cancer patients to make sure that their mind and their body are in sync to fight together this, this disease. So how does immunotherapy work? Um, okay, so immunotherapy is kind of the hot things these days. Um, and I have to say that the, the whole idea of immuno, immunotherapy is, 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 is really very simple, is to recognize the cancer cell, uh, you know, uh, target the cancer cell and eliminate the cancer cell. That's the concept of immunotherapy, okay? So for very many years, especially when I was way much younger, we always ask ourselves, what the heck is going on with the immune system? Why is that the immune system is, isn't taking care of the cancer cells? I mean, you might think from a scientific standpoint, that's, that's, that's the obvious thing that anybody would think early on because every time that we have uh, an exogenous pathogen in the body, it's the immune system that, that really reacts and eliminates the pathogen. So not being able from the immune system standpoint to to actually eliminate the cancer cells was really a puzzle for us for really, really, really long time until um, fantastic scientists, they came out with um, um, explanation for why that happened. And now we are using all those explanations to develop what is called immunotherapies. And the immunotherapies come in, in, in different colors and flavors, okay? So you can call immunotherapy to very many different things. You can call immunotherapies to, for example, uh, vaccines against cancer, okay? Uh, for example, we have the HPV vaccine. Uh, we have the vaccines against hepatitis B that also prevents um, uh, liver cancer. And in the first case, as the HPV is the uh, vaccine against the uh, papilloma viruses that prevent cervix cancer. Um, we have what is called um, CART um, uh, immunotherapy in which um, the T cells from the patient are um, um, modified using genetic engineer to, to and, and, and put back the patient so they can actually more effectively fight the cancer cells. Um, there are other things that has to do with um, targeted antibodies, antibodies that they carry therapeutics, they can, they can target one particular molecule in the cancer cell and they can eliminate that cancer cell. I mean, immunotherapy is, is a collection of things and the goal of immunotherapy is not only to eliminate um, cancer cells, but also to create some kind of immune memory. And I think that's the really cool part because with, if, you have, if you have an immune system that has an immune memory, which is basically what you're trying to do when you get vaccinated for, for COVID, you, you try to, to eventually teach your immune system to recognize the pathogen later on and then eliminate it. Well, we want to do the same with cancer. If you can, if you can create what is called an immune memory that um, will recognize, um, you will have T cells or cells of the immune system that will recognize any bad cell in the future um, that might show up in your body um, as a relapse to your cancer, then it can be immediately eliminated. That will be the best therapeutics. So I'm, I'm very hopeful about um, immunotherapy. Um, I, I think the progress has been tremendous and the findings are very promising. Nowadays it's broadly applied. There are, I think, something like 20 different cancers where immunotherapy is given to a patient. And, and, um, but immunotherapy doesn't, doesn't work for everybody. Uh, there are some particular genetic conditions for which immunotherapy can be applied. Nevertheless, it's, it's a fantastic um, tool that we have on hand. Okay, um, let me go to the next question. Um, um, so are there any negative risk factors or ways to prevent cancer? So I'm, I'm a person that believes that um, cancer can be eliminated by being proactive in two areas, um, prevention and early detection. 
Okay, so we have a group of, of population, you know, my age or or older or something that, you know, we are in the pipeline that we maybe we haven't been um, so proactive in prevention and early detection and for which we need therapeutics. So in case that we get sick, we need to have something out there that can help us to deal with the disease. But I think we need to, to put a lot of weight on prevention and early detection. You know, if you if you don't smoke, your chances of developing lung cancer are much lower. Okay, 90% of all lung cancers are related to smoking. Colon cancer is a lot related to uh, the food that you ingest, you know, trans fats. Um, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying don't, don't, you know, I'm not saying don't eat junk food, you know, but don't eat it every day, all the time, right? Um, the other thing is that, um, uh, for example, uh, exposed to um, chemicals, okay, or exposed to radiation, or exposed to to things that they are detrimental, or you know, uh, taking a sun bath and never use a sun protector. I mean, all these kind of things really uh, increases your chances of developing mutations in your genes that could end up in some sort of cancer. So, what you definitely want is to what you definitely want is to um, reduce that, and if you can't then if you can prevent those things from, from happening, be, be proactive on, on early detection. Like for example, um, nowadays we can have colonoscopies or, or mammograms out there. Sure, it's not really, it's, it's not really, there's not any way that I can tell you that a mammogram is something that you wanna have every year because, you know, it's satisfying. No, I mean, they squeeze your breast and, it's, and even if we have really nice uh, images and sensitive images systems, still you get some discomfort it needs to be done. That's the point. It needs to be done because if something is detected at that stage, you have 90% chances of, of, of cure of being cured. So same with a colonoscopy. No, it's, it's, it's definitely not pleasant. And I, I think we shouldn't, we, sh we shouldn't say the opposite in, in, in the sense that, oh, it's, it's nothing. It's not pleasant, the, 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 the preparation, but nevertheless, you get it done if the polyp is detected is removed immediately um, and um, your chances of developing colon cancers goes all the way down. So just be proactive. Um, healthy life goes many ways, right? Um, so I, I think that's, that's the way that we should proceed. Um, you know, early detection and, and prevention. And the, the other thing that I wanna mention is that I'm very, very hopeful on early detection because of the kind of technologies that they're coming. You saw some of the nanotechnologies coming with these vaccines related to COVID, but you will see a lot of nanotechnology advances in terms of imaging. So if we can detect the cancer when it's in the very early stage, you know, when, when there's a handful of bad cells out there and we can eliminate that, we're talking about another disease that can be easily controllable. Um, are damages to the circadian clock environmental editable or both? Um, we are studying that um, when you disrupt your circadian clock, and this is what we, um, this is the hypothesis of our lab. When, when you disrupt, um, let, me, let me go back one step. So the, the hypothesis that we have in the lab is that um, the cell division that occurs in a 24 hour cycle follow a very, timely schedule during the day. And that has been shown by others. So the idea is that the clock that monitors the time zones on the day, okay, and the um, on the cell cycle clock are deeply connected. And the idea in my lab is that when that connection is broken for whatever reason, a mutation in heredity, uh, heredity, heredity oh my gosh, I hate that word, factor, um, um, that disrupt the clock from the cell division cycle is what led the cell division cycle to run loose and then um, no, and they're not controlled anymore. And, and that's what causes some proliferative disorders. That is the hypothesis that we run in my lab. Now, um, are those uh, factors, some of them um, um, uh, uh, hereditable? Um, we don't know yet. Um, we did find mutations in circadian proteins that make the circadian protein not to work properly. Um, some of my colleagues, they discovered that in the sleep syndromes, but we are discovering that 
um, related to cancer. So <clears throat> whether that is or not hereditable, we, we don't know at this point. What has been the most difficult part of your research? The most difficult part of my research, the most difficult part of my research is, is not to have enough time to do everything that I want so I can make sure that I can help cure this disease as soon as possible. Um, my goal is to see that my research cures, cures someone before um, I die and I'm, I'm done. So, um, so the, the most difficult part is to see patients um, for which there is no any uh, longer therapeutics and not being to, able to help. Yeah, that's the part that is the most troublesome for me. Do you think that there is a cure inside? I'm absolutely positive about everything that has to do with cure, curing cancer. Um, I think we have already very good treatments and um, the success in curing cancer has been going up and up and up uh, every single year for very many reasons because we have done tremendously, tremendously good interventions, but also because you, every single one of you has been very active, very proactive in preventing the disease from happening by being um, healthier. And um, I think this is a disease that the, the best way to cure it is to, is to as from, from us, for us to prevent uh, happening. And if it's the case, um, I think with the technologies that we have on hand and with the technologies that we are developing these days, we, we will manage this disease. Yeah. Okay, guys, I'm gonna leave you here. Um, thanks a lot. Thanks the Relay for Life for everything that you guys do. Um, you really rock. And I hope next year we all walk together. Take care.